Clients are looking for trusted advice and a sense of stability as they navigate the new normal. And by using Bill.com, accounting firms can free up more time for valuable strategic advisory services by helping clients shift their accounts payable process online. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Bill.com, later in the episode. So the chief executive and chief technology officer of Wirecard is Marcus Braun, who the Wall Street Journal notes is known for his uh, tall, he's, he's tall and known for his intense manner of speaking and adopted the sartorial style of the tech world wearing black turtlenecks similar to Apple Inc. founder Steve Jobs. Oh, and, 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 uh, and that remind the blood girl. Yeah, you remember uh, Theranos. Theranos. Yeah. Elizabeth Holmes. Yes, she also did the same thing, right? Two frauds perpetrated by Steve Jobs copycats. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Cinder. If you've ever tried to get your clients Stripe, Square, or PayPal transactions into QuickBooks or Zero, you've probably pulled your hair out a few times trying to get income and fees recorded correctly so that the deposit amounts match the bank statement so you can reconcile. Did you know that you could be using Cinder to automatically do this for you? Cinder can auto-categorize these transactions, adding additional data like classes and locations, and accurately post them into the accounting system. Cinder also enables your clients to receive online credit card payments using the payment service of their choice, while trusting it won't create any additional tracking overhead. If you need support, Cinder offers free help using your favorite means of communication, be it chat, email, or phone. To try out Cinder for free, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Cinder. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash S-Y-N-D-E-R. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Relay Financial. Wouldn't it be great if you could open a new business bank account 100% online without having to go to a physical bank branch? Relay is a 100% online bank that is 100% focused on small business. With Relay, you can effortlessly collaborate with team members, manage payments, and issue corporate cards all from a bank. Accountants and bookkeepers love Relay because they get a partner portal, can manage staff access without compromising security, and enjoy enriched direct bank feeds to QuickBooks Online and Zero. To sign up in less than 10 minutes and enjoy stress-free banking with no monthly fees or monthly minimum balances, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Relay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-E-L-A-Y. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Blake, it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Yes, and you yourself. A lot of change. So you are now moved. Your, your stuff's officially been put in a truck. It's no longer in California. It's now at your new house. I no longer have possessions or residency in California. I am now a citizen of Arizona, the land of the free, as I understand it to be. Is that true, David? <laughs> I don't, it's freer, but you know, more and more Californians like you keep moving here. Oh, well, it's really funny because the the first thing my my new neighbor across the street, I saw them out there going somewhere, and I said hi, husband and wife, and I think they've like grown children, so they moved in twenty years ago when the house was built. And the husband says, you know, welcome. Where'd you come from? And I said, uh, California, L.A. And he said, oh, great. Well, I hope you didn't bring your politics with you. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, I can't speak for my wife, but uh, I personally am fleeing. Yeah, I think I've seen some bumper stickers around here. You know, it's like, <laughs> don't, don't, don't California, my Arizona, don't you know, kill. things along those lines. But that's much different because I think Tucson probably politically is a little bit more blue leaning, um, uh -huh. definitely a little bit more hippy dippy, you know, uh, but Phoenix is much different. Um, well, and specifically, we're living in Scottsdale, which I understand is very, very split like right down the middle. So uh, should be some interesting conversations with my neighbors. I, I like politics. I like talking about it. It doesn't, I think there's a way to do it that doesn't have to blow up in your face. We'll see. I'll let you, I'll keep you posted. But yeah, yeah, the, uh, the drama. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, I'm here. Um, what else is new? Oh, we're all wearing face masks. So that, that was, they were doing that in LA and that just passed in the uh, Phoenix city council. And I think the Scottsdale mayor issued an order after. Now, when did that start? So I was in Phoenix this weekend uh -huh. visiting my, my father for Father's Day. And we wound up going up to – there's a lake north of Phoenix, a big water reservoir called Lake Pleasant. We were there. We wound up – it gets to be so hot, you just have to go inside. So we went into this bar restaurant place to eat lunch and nobody had masks on. It was like those – 
photos they've been posting. You know, like, look at these people at spring break. It was, it wasn't, okay, it wasn't spring break bad, but at the same time, mm-hmm. after we left, we're like, yeah, that may not have been the best idea. So, on what, what day did masks go into effect in Phoenix or Maricopa County? Because in Tucson, they went into effect Saturday morning. I, I think it started Saturday or Friday. Uh, Friday night, I think, is when it started. And so everyone in Scottsdale, Phoenix, if you're in a public place within six feet of somebody else, you're supposed to wear a mask. And all the stores are enforcing it. And everybody, I've seen everybody wearing them, which is good because they actually have a very, very, very beneficial effect and can reduce transmission by up to 60%, which is exactly what we need to do. I'm all in Maybe favor of that. aren't enforced at lakes. Well, it's so the governor, uh, Governor Ducey, left it up to local jurisdictions to decide what to do. So it has to be the mayor or the city council yes. in that area. Anyway, that's Should enough. Jump into the news? Yeah, let's let's get into PPP uh, because there was uh, uh, some big news about transparency of the PPP. We were talking in our last episode about a uh, big controversy. The administration, according to Larry Kudlow, Trump's senior economic advisor, and Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, The administration wasn't planning on releasing the names of any people who got PPP loans. But since our last episode, that has changed. So now the Trump administration is going to be more transparent, like they originally promised, and disclose some of the names of the businesses that have received PPP loans. Actually, over 75% of the businesses who receive those loans are going to have their names, addresses, NAICS codes, zip codes, business type, demographic data, nonprofit information, job supported, and loan amount ranges uh, in five different brackets will be released. But again, they released this news Friday night again, right? Late mm-hmm. Friday night. So Wednesday, they, they re- released news about the new um, forgiveness application. We'll talk to them about that separately. Mm-hmm. But yeah, again, they waited till after Friday evening to drop this news again. Yeah, I mean, all the unfavorable news gets dumped on Friday, right? If, so, um, but again, like I think this was a negotiation, right? The administration started from a point of no transparency and compromised. Actually, I'm I'm kind of impressed that the l- amount is so low. So any loan above 150 thousand is going to be disclosed, and if it's under that amount, it will not. And only aggregated, anonymized data is going to be released aggregated by zip code, industry, business type, various demographic categories. Yeah. And they're going to make sure they don't show the home addresses or anything like right. that. That's all going to be with help. So basically all the sole proprietors, all the very small businesses, you know, that got loans under 150,000 don't have to worry about their name going on some list and then, you know, getting shit from people and um, anyone over that you do, which is going to be interesting because uh, like what led to this transparency, I think was uh, reports that members of Congress received these loans. Like it was going to be pretty hard for the administration and the Republicans in Congress to s- deny transparency on this program when at least four members of Congress have taken the loans, according to an article that came out in uh, Politico on the 16th. Before you jump into the article more, though, uh, what I found was interesting is remember last week we said, oh, Mark Rubio was all for – so last week he was like, we're not going to disclose. And now he flip-flopped again and now he's, he's up for – he wants it disclosed now. He's saying, you know, Americans deserve to know of course. how effective it was. It's just the, like that guy flip-flops on this PPP stuff more than anybody else I know. It's kind of been amazing. It um, is. It is. Um, what, this, so this is kind of like um, but beside the point now because they have decided to release this information. But the, the, the four members of Congress who are highlighted in this Politico article are two Democrats, two Republicans. You know, one of them owns a car dealership in – Texas, Roger Williams of Texas. He's a wealthy businessman who owns auto dealerships and he has like a net worth of $26 million. He's one of the wealthiest people in Congress. I mean, most Congress people are millionaires, uh, but he is really, really wealthy and he got a big loan. Well, we don't know exactly how much it was, but we will uh, for his, I think it's like a Jeep dealership in Texas. So um, that was like a big sticking point for, uh, for the you know, Republicans administration was going to be hard to overcome that. So that's, that's yeah. done. And somebody else's husband, uh, they took out, they had a $15 million loan, but they re- they returned it in full. Yeah. That was one of the Democrats. Yeah. Um, Debbie Mukarsal Powell of Florida. And I guess it was like a restaurant chain that returned the loan. So with all this disclosure coming out, one of the articles actually hit on the SBA themselves 
So how, how have you, do you do you have any idea how big the SBA is? I, I think they have a few thousand employees, something like three thousand to four thousand. Thirty thirty two hundred employees, and an annual budget shy of one billion dollars. Now, now keep in mind, and I saw this this three day, and then it be, maybe I can try to track something down more. But my understanding is the vast, 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 vast majority of small businesses have never interacted with the SBA until the PPA, PPP loan. Right. So, what has this agency been doing? <laughs> like, like, well, like for decades, like a billion dollar budget, a billion dollars. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, is that like a lot of money for three thousand employees? I don't know. I mean, from a from a government bloat perspective like <laughs> like what are they producing i mean how many employees the irs have you said i think you mentioned you saw in the news uh, they're, rehi- they're hiring again or something they're shutting uh, down hiring what are they doing yeah well so the irs has um decided to start bringing their employees back to their offices which is you know a big deal considering that they had an outbreak in texas at one of their centers uh, recently we can talk about that before we get into that do you want to hit on the ppp Loan forgiveness application? We could do that, but we could also uh, – I think there's an article to bridge us there. Mm-hmm. So charter schools have been t- getting the PPP loans. So how does that work? Because they're not-for-profits are allowed to do it? So charter schools are weird because over here you have private schools, which are kind of ran like a business, right? They don't really – a lot of private schools, they do not get government money. Charter schools are weird because they are kind of ran privately, but they're part of the school districts and they get government money. Because basically there's vouchers and grants. And you're going to have to familiarize yourself with this because that is hence the school system in Arizona, okay. unfortunately. And so they're they're trying, to, they're trying to have it both ways. Like over here, like I'm a business. I get a PPP loan. And over here, they're not a business. But a lot of these charter schools are backed by Bloomberg and Bill Gates, right? And they've just quietly just have been taking the money. Huh. And a regular, regular schools can't get it. Um, and then some of them have even taken the money and then laid off teachers still. So – Every week we're going to see more more things exposed. The way they figured this out is they basically um, – because the charter schools on one hand are a little bit – they're part of the school district. So they're part of the school board meetings, which are public. Mm-hmm. And so they basically watch these virtual school board meetings and point over the meeting minutes and figure out what school, schools have taken this money. So it's been $48 million in funds that have gone to 27 charter schools. That is interesting that they can get access to this money, but like a regular school cannot. And the – normal public schools, whatever you want to call them, they're going to face terrible budget cuts potentially because now all these local governments don't have money because of tax revenues are down. Yeah. So, so I, I think, you know, as this gets disclosed, there's going to be another bucket of people. They figure out like, oh, these people took out loans and these people took out loans. So the, the loan forgiveness application changed. So that was released last week. So this is good news. Because there's an easy version of the forgiveness application that applies to borrowers who are self-employed and have no employees or did not reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25% and didn't reduce the number of hours of their employees or experienced reductions in business activity as a result of health directives related to COVID-19 and did not reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25%. So if any of those apply to you, then you can use the easy application and then you don't have to submit nearly as much documentation. It's like a three page form. You're just certifying that I I didn't reduce the hours more than 25% and I was impacted by COVID and um, you can get that, that uh, forgiveness. So the the regular application went down from 11 pages to I think seven now as well. Oh, okay. That decreased in size as well. And then both applications give you the option for that eight week versus the 24 week. So, you know, this is good. Like it's, it's hopefully it's going to make more businesses apply for this money because there is still a hundred billion dollars left on the table. I I think I saw somebody uh, tweet that they attended an AICPA uh, round table on PPP, even after these easy applications came out. And they, they basically, the, the argument of the AICPA is to still wait, like have your client fill it out when they're done, have it ready, but wait for new guidance. Like they fully expect new guidance to come out and, and re- revisions for these easy applications as well. Lovely. So, well, you know, we're still not out of this. We're still not out of it. All that uncertainty is one of the reasons why the money may not be getting to the people who need it the most. I spotted a story in the Wall Street Journal called PPP Small Business Loans Left Behind Many of America's Neediest Firms. And we've got some data now. We don't have a ton of data because the SBA hasn't been very helpful. But 
you know, Wall Street Journal compiled what they have and figured out what industries got the most loans uh, and and which didn't, and it sort of correlated that with how hard were they hit. So the service industry was, you know, one of the worst to hit. Obviously, sixty seven percent of jobs lost from March to May uh, were in service industry. They only got forty two percent of the loans as of May thirtieth, according to economists at S and P Global Inc. The hotel and food services industry shed 40% of its jobs, 5.7 million from January to May, the most of any sector. And as of June 12th, it had received only 8% of the loans. But I think if I remember correctly, if we took the time machine back three months ago, like the way this was written, they did not want the loans because they were pretty sure they weren't going to re- reopen. Right. Like originally they, they they did not want the loans. They wanted other considerations. And because I think there's a whole nother part of the stimulus that's really set up for hotels. Well, I guess yeah. maybe, but I, I guess that's part of it. But like you would think that um, if the idea is to keep people on payroll and not on unemployment, then right, the, the industries that are losing the most jobs, you would want to keep those people on payroll. But the, like the the whole program was built for eight weeks originally. Like everyone's like thinking this is going to be over in two months. Yeah, no chance of that, right? I mean, as they were creating the program, we all realized it was going to last a lot longer than that. So what ended up happening is that the companies that were hit the least by the pandemic, an example is professional scientific and technical services providers, they only lost 480,000 jobs, 5% of total jobs, but they got 13% of the loans. Professional services, right? scientific tech services, these are the kind of businesses where you can work from home. So they were hurt the least by this. Uh, you know, and accounting firms are in there. They were able to take advantage of this program because they could keep their people employed. So the, the the question I have is, did this program actually save jobs or did it just supplement the earnings of companies that were going to survive anyway? How successful was this program? What did we get for the $600 billion or I guess $500 billion because we haven't spent – the other, uh, the, the last 100 yet. I think it's, yeah, it's about 100, 120 billion yeah. still left. Yep. Like, did it just end up supporting businesses that continued to operate? Because if it did that, then like, what's the, what's the point? I mean, obviously there's examples of businesses that survived because of this, but uh, that may not be like the majority even, right? It may be a small group of businesses that actually were able to survive as a result and the rest just got free money. And it's interesting because you look at the map of the United States the businesses that got the most money or the the greatest percentage of businesses, I suppose, that got the money, they're all in states that were hit like the least. Some of them are like North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska had the highest percentages of businesses getting these loans of all the businesses in those states. And we talked about that before too. And a lot of it is just because it's a lot of firms and they have banking relationships and those banks didn't have the same volume. It was the states like California that where the average small business owner, they all go to Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo, how do they prioritize any of those loans, right? Yeah. They, they're overwhelmed with the, the volume. And st- states um, that were really hit like California and New York, and Washington, Oregon, like got the fewest loans percentage wise. It'd be interesting to see how, if those have like what that was over time because in the beginning it was very 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 um, disbalanced, not not in very good balance, and I wonder if it's coming down or turning the other way. Um, I did see that the SBA launches a tool to match underserved borrowers with PPP lenders, so they they have a tool called Lender Match Online. I think of it as a marketplace. I can go and I can search. I need a I need a loan, and they're going to give me approved SBA lenders. Mm-hmm. So they're launching this and this is going to help connect people, uh, minority uh, depository institutions, certified development companies, farm credit system lenders, micro lenders. So it's really going to only connect them with even small lenders. So it's small lenders connecting to very small and disadvantaged businesses. Right. The thing is they, they announced this Friday to turn it back on 11 days before the June 30th deadline. But the kicker in this is this program this this website lender match it they launched it in 2017 and then what they did is they turned it off they turned it off in march so they could work on the um stimulus stuff oh so it was a website for their traditional lending programs so they already had a system set up to help underserved businesses and minority-based businesses get money right they had a system set up right 
And then they turn it off and then they flip it on like, hey, good news. You have uh, 11 days left to <laughs> apply now. It, I've, it's it's maddening. Like, it, the, the whole program was not designed to help the people that needed it the most. Like that's my conclusion. It helped a lot of businesses, but not the neediest ones. We'll get the data soon. And if the uh, SBA and the Treasury don't turn over the data, do you see uh, U.S. Democratic lawmakers are sending letters straight to the CEOs of banks asking for them for, to release the documents? No. I seen so, so they're just going to go pat. They're going to bypass the SBA entirely and just basically f- squeeze these large banks. Get them to, to, to give to us the, the data. info. Interesting. So I mentioned that IRS employees are returning to their offices. IRS employees in Utah, Texas, Kentucky – began reporting back to their buildings in the first week of June, according to the National Treasury Employees Union, and more facilities in other states began opening this week. But three IRS employees tested positive in Austin, Texas, according to Bloomberg Tax, which is you know causing a bit of distress among the employees there. The plan is, according to the IRS commissioner, Chuck Reddick, that all of the facilities will reopen in all the other states on July 13th. Part of the urgency is that they have a ton of unopened mail. Like the IRS employees have actually been doing pretty good working at home, apparently, but you can't open mail that's at the IRS processing center from home. And the IRS still gets a ton of paper returns. And they receive 1 million new pieces of mail each week, 1 million pieces of mail. And they have been closed for weeks and weeks and weeks. So now they have a 11 million pieces of mail that are unopened. <laughs> they have to go back. And I imagine and that's a, uh, one of those jobs where you stand right next to somebody else and do nothing but open a mail. And so you're not going to be able to have social distancing very well. Yeah. Trying it's to a, open up all that mail. I mean, yeah. Mail rooms are not exactly well ventilated generally. <laughs> They're opening 5 million pieces of mail per week. Uh, and they've got 11 million, you know, on back order basically. So they've got to take probably three weeks to get through all the mail that they've got and catch up. But that's just opening it, right? Who knows how long it'll take them to process it. Now, the IRS employees may be going back to the office, but tax court is not. They are going to be operating remotely, indefinitely. Now, they also still have a paperwork backlog in terms of their mailroom as well, but uh, they are somehow going to catch up on that by July 10th. Um, Some more IRS news. The IRS is being urged by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration to pursue preparers with overdue returns, debts, and penalties. Apparently, there are tens of thousands of preparers who are noncompliant with their own taxes. There are 10,000, over 10,000 preparers who prepared more than 2 million tax returns for clients in 2016, but who didn't file their own personal tax return to, to report the income they received. Is it just like you're just too busy? You're constantly doing somebody else's. You never get around to doing yours, or is it on purpose? Is there is there some part of the tax code that preparers know about that the rest of us don't? <laughs> well, they, they they must be really aware that like you can get away with doing this for a long time, right? Because <laughs> the IRS isn't coming after them. Uh, it's just kind of it's just kind of crazy to me. The Treasury Inspector General estimates that the IRS could collect forty five point six million in potential taxes if they just simply worked on. 6,900 of the preparer non-filer cases. And and you just wonder, like, why isn't the IRS going after these guys? It just sounds re- – it's just it's, – it, it, it reads really poor, right? Like, Yeah, like, the you know, we know that there's a lot no of – excuse not to file. Just do it. You know how to do it. Yeah, exactly. You know how to – you would think that the IRS would be enforcing the rules on the people who are preparing taxes for other people, right? It should be held to a very high standard. But that obviously isn't happening. So – This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Bill.com. Through these uncertain times, one thing has become clear. Accounting firms are in a unique and trusted position to help their clients adapt. For your firm, that means leaning into the services your clients have always depended on and more. And for your clients, it means helping them move quickly to a remote model and bringing key financial processes like accounts payable online smoothly. 
Using Bill.com, the intelligent business payments platform, accounting firms can take a client's time-consuming manual AP process and transform it completely with automation, tracking, mobility, and transparency, easing your client's shift to working remotely and setting the stage for strategic conversations about how your firm can help them navigate the new normal. To learn more about how Bill.com can help your firm automate AP and offer client advisory services, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash bill. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash B-I-L-L. Bill.com, the intelligent business payments platform. So remember uh, last week we talked about the AICP of Canada, I forgot the Canadian Charter Professionals. I don't know the exact name right now. Sorry, I do not have the name. But they were um, the identities of accounting firms and accountants were stolen. Right, they got hacked. Yeah, they got hacked. Well, it didn't take very long. Now, I'm not saying these two hacks are related, but a Toronto chartered accounting firm is, uh, is trying to recover from a ransomware attack. So some of the things that were stolen, the bank logging credentials, including answers to security questions. For their clients. For their clients. And then screenshots of hundreds of folders from companies' computers. So, so people are selling this data, like they have access to all, yeah. all this data. And the interesting thing is IT World Canada, who th- th- this article is from, they are not naming the firm because they haven't uh, b- confirmed whether or not for sure it was a breach of the security controls at the firm. Hmm. But like, how do you get ransomware if, if a security control did not get breached? Somebody's machine somewhere in the system got compromised, which would be a security breach. Well, the lesson here for me is don't store your clients' logins and security questions in an unencrypted format. <laughs> you know, because it, if it's encrypted, at least if you get hacked, they can't get into that database, right? People should be using password managers. One password, last pass. You can get an enterprise account for LastPass and you can securely store all that stuff and delegate access just to the people who need it. You know, but so many firms are still storing all this stuff in Excel files on their you know, network drive. It's just nuts. And they're probably calling it passwords. Yeah, or <laughs> client passwords. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, because how else will your employees find the document? You know? I saw another, another article about only one third of small businesses inform their employees about their personal device security requirements. So more and more people now are bringing their own devices to work, their phone, their tablet, bring their own computer. Now with people working on at home, it's pretty, it's even more extreme, right? But one third of all small businesses do not even tell their employees, give zero guidance about it. All right. Let's talk about uh, the big frauds, Wirecard, Luckin, Coffee. I don't know if we talked about this on the show, but there was a story I don't remember where it was. It was a really great opinion piece. Uh, It it was either in the Wall Street Journal or one of these accounting publications talking about how uh, we should all be looking out for the next big frauds that are going to be coming to light as a result of the recession. Because every time you enter a recession, all sorts of malfeasance comes to light because it's no longer possible to hide it. And that is exactly what has happened with these two really big companies. So, well, you brought this up, not not so much related to the recession, more of general, the um, the tricks people were playing with their numbers. Right. Right. And it was adding up quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. And I think this even caught up to um, what's the clothing, athletic clothing, Under Armour. Yes. Like they, they kind of almost a year ago, this caught up to them. And so you, I remember you were talking about this. The There's so many tricks people can play with the numbers now that are we, is everybody's numbers just fake. Right. And now we're well, seeing, yes, apparently this is true. Well, yeah, some, right? Uh, and 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 so there, I've got two great stories for you. So I'll let you choose. Do you want to start in Asia or in Europe? Um, do the do the Lucan coffee because uh, is it Lucan or Lucking? I just Luckian? say Lucan because I Luckian. I don't Lucan. You know, Lucky. I don't know. I think um, I think that's correct. Actually, I think it's tied to the word Lucky. Okay, so Lucan coffee, amazing story. They are just three years old. And they are a startup that is beating Starbucks in China. At least they were until this all came to light. They opened 4,500, more than 4,500 stores across China, which made it bigger by location than Starbucks in China. They became a unicorn, meaning they were valued at over a billion dollars after barely one year. And they went public in less than two years in May of 2019 and raised $645 million in their IPO. Their valuation in January was $12 billion. They had doubled that. They were 
They went from six to twelve billion just eight months after going public, and recently raised another eight hundred and sixty-five million selling convertible bonds and additional stock. They are listed in the United States on the Nasdaq exchange. So, like, amazing success story, and and one of the things that's really interesting about Luck and that made it a darling of the tech world is that they had a mobile app. And so if you're a Chinese consumer who is developing a taste for coffee, which Luckin was really working to grow in China, right? People traditionally drink tea, not a lot of coffee. Coffee is really expensive. Starbucks in China costs almost the same as it does in the United States, making it really expensive. So only you know wealthy people could afford it. Luckin had a mobile app where if you downloaded that, you would get push notifications of discounts and the discounts would be like 30 to 70%. And you could either go pick up your coffee or you could have it delivered. So super convenient, right? Um, super high tech, like a lot of these like Chinese companies that are way ahead of US companies when it comes to ease of use on mobile and, and delivery and all that. So, you know, there's this like tech company, actually it kind of reminds me of WeWork, right? Where it's actually a really traditional company disguised as a tech company, right? Because they're a coffee chain, right? Yes, they sell yes. coffee. <laughs> so, just you know, three years, and they are worth twelve billion dollars. Well, on April second, here comes the the fall. It came to light that many of their sales had been faked. Apparently, from the second quarter to the fourth quarter of two thousand nineteen, which was uh, during and after the IPO, they fabricated. The COO, the chief operating officer, and some other highly placed executives fabricated transactions amounting to $310 million. And the way they did it is interesting, but also not super sophisticated. They were selling vouchers to companies with ties to Luckin's chairman and controlling shareholder, Charles Liu. This is a real program they had where you could buy uh, vouchers of Luckin Coffee and give them to your customers as a, as a third party. So, you know, let's say I'm, um, I don't know, I'm a car rental company in China. And while people are waiting for their car to become available, I might offer them a luck and coffee voucher. So I don't have coffee at my rental shop, but I say, Hey, here's a free voucher, order your luck and coffee, and they'll deliver it while you're waiting for your car to be ready. Something like that. Right. So companies buy these vouchers at a discount and, you know, give them to their customers. Well, the, COO, right, and these executives were selling vouchers to companies and they weren't actually being used. And they sold million, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars of these vouchers. Now, that would be suspicious because, uh, you know, you got to have costs associated with delivering this coffee, create, you know, making it, right? If you don't have cost of goods sold, that's going to be a big red flag. So they also created a fictitious procurement employee who had a name, Lin Liang. And this is where the auditors got suspicious. This one employee processed more than 140 million payments for raw materials, delivery, and HR services related to the fictitious vouchers. So 310 million of fake revenue, 140 million of fake cost of goods sold. And uh, when all this came to light, because the auditors uncovered it, uh, I think it was Ernst & Young, the stock plunged 75% overnight. I've been watching that story. I just haven't brought it to the show. But you're right. I think it fits in well because there was another major fraud that went down. Do you want to jump into wire, Wirecard? Yeah. So, so Wirecard, right? Let's jump across oceans or across a continent to Europe. Wirecard, now, I had never heard of them either. Which is interesting because they're apparently a 20-year-old company. And, and they're a payment processor, right? That's correct. They're a payment processor. Um, they kind of play middleman. Um, people, uh, I saw, that's funny because uh, I have them also in App News, uh, an expense type product in France. So let's say like an Expensify is partnering with them to create a debit card, right? So that was announced this week that, that they were partnering with another company. So that's kind of the space they're in. It helps, you know. They're competing with like Square, right? They're a modern payment processing company. Exactly. And, and they have been growing like crazy. Yeah. And right. Like there's a chart of their growth from 2012 to 2019 where it's just an exponential curve. They had revenue of 2.8 billion euros in 2019. Just massive. Yeah. And so their CEO stepped down this week uh, because of the accounting scandal. And it comes basically one day after Wirecard admitted to auditors that EY could not find 1.9 billion 
of cash that was on its balance sheet. Yes, this is uh, amazing. And it was the fourth. So they had to restate their, their, their basically postpone their 2019 annual report for the fourth time, fourth time they've had to postpone that. And the interesting thing is, so the, the news follows an extensive investigation by Financial Times into the Munich-based payments processors accounting practices. Among the newspaper's allegations are that Wirecard's Singapore office used forged and backdated contracts to inflate revenue, and that staff appeared to conspire to fraudulently inflate the sales and profits at its Dubai and Dublin subsidiaries, and potentially misleading EY. And what I'm confused by this is because my understanding is EY, they've been with EY for like a decade. Right. So how, like, how, like, how does... And I don't know the audit process. I did. I do not. But I, I, how does that happen? How how is somebody in the books <laughs> for a decade get deceived? So I don't know the answer to that. But you are asking the right question because it is amazing that it took cash confirmations to discover this fraud. I mean, that's like the l- last point at which you can catch something is when they have in- created fake revenue. And, you know, eventually revenue has to become cash in the bank, right? That's the, otherwise somebody will figure out it's not real. So they created fake bank accounts in the Philippines on their books. And the way it got caught is the auditors were sending confirmation letters. They were, they were doing bank, you know, cash confirmations. This is one of the first things that you do as an auditor is, is, you know, you you look at the trial balance of a business and you go through all the bank accounts and you send letters to the banks saying, do you actually have a uh, an account for this company that we're auditing? And if, 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 please tell us the amount. And then you compare that to their you know books and you make sure the cash is real, that it's not fake. And when they did that, uh, apparently, you know, Wirecard was saying that they had $2 billion in the Philippines. They actually produced fraudulent confirmation letters. So they actually tried to fake that to trick their auditors. And uh, then the auditors got suspicious, I guess, about the letters. They didn't, they didn't seem right. And so then they actually called up the banks and the bank said, no, we, we don't actually even have accounts for Wirecard. So that's how all this came out. And it's crazy that it got to this point, $2 billion. And, and there's, there's a quote here from the fund manager at DECA Investments, a top 10 shareholder at the firm. So, so this is a significant position they have in this company. And he said they are stunned. And I'm, I, it makes me wonder, like, these investment companies, when they, they invest in these other companies, what due diligence do they do? Oh, probably not all that much. I mean, that's what the auditors are there for, right? So the, who do the auditors work for? The company or the investors or the, or the public? Another really good question. Yeah. The, I know we've <laughs> talked about this. Well, they are, they are hired and paid by Wirecard, but the work they do is supposedly for the investors. So that's the conflict of interest inherent in auditing. And let's quantify this again. Like Luckin was valued at $12 billion and that was mostly erased. Very similar situation for Wirecard where they lost – I'm not sure exactly where it stands right now, but it was two billion in market value erased immediately, and then like another nine billion, so eleven billion dollars of market value just you know destroyed. Shares are down seventy five percent over two days. Well, they say they might even make it out. Like the where card could completely go under. Yeah. Well, because and here's the reason is that they have all of these credit lines. You mentioned that they had to delay their issuance of their financial results, right? Their 2019 financials. They have all these credit lines worth two point two billion that could be canceled because of this delay. Uh, and you know, if, if I'm a bank, right, do I really want to extend credit to a company that has fabricated two billion dollars of cash? Uh, I don't think so. But yeah, who knows? And and actually, in, in a side note here: so the chief executive and chief technology officer of Wirecard is Marcus Braun, who the Wall Street Journal notes is known for his uh, tall, he's, he's tall and known for his intense manner of speaking and adopted the sartorial style of the tech world wearing black turtleneck similar to Apple Inc. founder Steve Jobs. Oh, and, 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 uh, and that remind the blood girl. Yeah, you remember uh, Theranos. Theranos. Yes. Elizabeth Holmes. Yes, she also did the same thing, right? Two frauds perpetrated by Steve Jobs copycats. Uh, and And... Braun's in trouble because he controlled 7% of Wirecard shares. And he was at the helm for a good 17 years or something. Like, I think he's been... Yeah. A long time, right? Yeah. I, I don't know if he's the founder or what, but 
yeah, it might as well have been right. Worth one billion before this, and those that's now down to um, a few hundred million. You know, I mean, eventually they'll they'll trace this back to somebody, right? Or a team of people, right? Like, I, I think th- there has to be a lot of group sync when these things go on. And it's very rarely one person. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just the beginning, probably, right? Like these are some big ones, but we can expect some more frauds to come to light because now people are starting to look, you know, critically at businesses uh, given the recession. People have more time now, right? <laughs> people have more time, exactly. less money. Due diligence is going to go up. Absolutely. You want to get into some app news? Let's do it. So Receipt Bank, right? Yeah, we can talk about Receipt Bank man acquisition. So Receipt Bank acquired, a, they call it a data quality specialist called Xavier. So Xavier, I think maybe here as in the States, may not have heard a lot about Xavier yet. Um, they really, they won a Zero's National Emerging App Partner of the Year Award. Yeah, they're new to me. I, I never heard of them before. Yeah, I, I, they've came across my radar. I've seen them. I've seen apps like them in the past. And so what they do is they, it's like a toolkit that, and this would be the wrong word to use, but I always think it's, it's – so you know like you can get an antivirus product for your computer, and it's always scanning on your computer looking for viruses on your computer. Imagine if you had something like looking at your data of your accounting system for problems. So, so, it, so it's connecting to your, to your accounting data, looking for duplicates. Um, Miscoded things. Um, you can slice. You can actually use it to do some reporting and things like that. Uh, dates, like hey, these things were uh, changed changed after X date. Uh, it looks at patterns with your suppliers, right? It's really you know es- escalating, um, elevating visibility into potential problems in a data file of the accounting system. And I've seen products like this come and go over time. Um, one of the early ones in the QuickBooks world was something called Audit My Books, right? And so Xavier's in that space. They're providing that service. I mean, I could have really used this when I was in practice because I, you know, supervise lots and lots of bookkeepers and without digging into every file, it was really hard to know if they were doing a good job. And so this move's going to consolidate, they're calling it the two highest rated services in the zero ecosystem. And so it kind of makes sense. Like if, if Receipt Bank is pulling data, right? And, and take you, so if you're taking data that's in paper form, right. Receipt Bank's taking that data, cleaning it up at one level and then shoving it in the accounting system. It kind of makes sense to have that other piece of this, right? Uh, to also like, hey, we're, we're shoving data in, but data is also getting in your accounting system from other places. Well, yeah. And, and if they're shoving data in, I want to make sure that the data looks right. And that's clean yeah. going in. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because I think in a way like Here's another example of an app that you could argue should be a feature of Zero in QuickBooks. Yeah. And so w- w- then I start thinking like, okay, maybe Zero should have bought them, right? Or QuickBooks should have bought them. So then it's like, why did Receipt Bank buy them? And I know we talked about this before, like, you know, Receipt Bank, there's hints of them uh, starting a bank. And Receipt, it's in bank the ha- name. <laughs> Re- Receipt Bank has a self-employed tool in the UK, right? Is Receipt Bank going to be our, a, a full-blown cloud accounting package here soon? It makes sense. If everybody else is consolidating features, right? Uh, GLs are becoming banks. Banks are becoming GLs. A solution like Receipt Bank could easily become a GL. If you're pushing data, why not push it into your own general ledger? Yeah. Okay. So that's Receipt Bank. Uh, I was one other piece of app news that I was following. I saw that Rewind now has a client data transfer tool for QuickBooks Online, which is like a way to completely clone a QuickBooks Online company. You can make a, a copy of one, which is pretty neat. Like the way that you could make a copy of a desktop file. Yeah. So you could have a, you could almost like have a template file. You could back up the template file and then restore that in a new QuickBooks Online file. So they haven't been doing this before? Is this, this is like a new thing? So I think you could have done it before through hacking like a little bit, but now they've actually built a product to properly address this use case. I think there were some creative ways people could figure out how to do it. Um, but I think they, and then that other company that Intuit bought, Chronobooks, I think actually did this. But it, but it's definitely, uh, like if you yeah. take on a franchisee and they have 20 locations and you want to get every single chart of accounts the same and, and all the items on the items is the same and the vendors is the same, this is a good method to do that. That's really cool. I mean, and also like testing, right? If you want to test an integration with like an inventory solution, but you don't want to mess up in a QuickBooks file, 
or you don't want to risk it, you could create a copy and then connect the app and see what happens. That's where this gets interesting. They, they, that's where I was you know, reading that. And you basically clone the data, connect the other app. Now you can actually test two apps in parallel, right? And, not, and keep them separated. Or, you know, if you just need like a demo file that you use to demonstrate something to a client or a potential client, uh, this is a great way to like create that demo account and then copy it when you need to use it so you don't muck up your demo data. I also like don't know the depth of this yet. And I can tell you there's not, you can't get payroll APIs, right? So there's going to be some level of data that they're only, the best they're going to be able to do is to kind of pull out the balances and create a journal entry. Mm. Like, there's just some data not available through an API. So it's, so it's not truly, like you said, about a QuickBooks desktop backup. That is a perfect backup bit for bit ones and zeros of the data. This is really, it's reading the data from an API, storing it, and then putting it back. Um, it, or better way to think about it, it's recreating the data, mm. ultimately, once it pulls down. Did you see BotKeeper had a $25 million raise? Oh, yeah, that's a lot. Big one. Series B, right? Yep, Series B. And they, um, the one th I think the thing I noticed in this article is, I mean, we've had, obviously, the history with, with BotKeeper, right? And like, oh, they weren't disclosing there's humans involved. But it's very, very clear in this uh article about, you know, for tasks that can't be automated, like tax filing, wealth management type uh, tasks, Bikekeeper connects clients with accounting firms and recruits its in-house team of CPAs and accountants to revamp the books and bring them up to date. That was something I noted in the uh, in the article. The tone of uh, the tune, right, that's being sung is that, hey, humans are involved, you know, in these processes. That, And I think in the past, we, we, we're, we're just questions on that. Well, that, that makes me happy, right? It's, it's all about transparency. Bringing it full circle, right? We started with PPP transparency, and now we're talking about transparency when it comes to humans and bots. So that's and good. The, and the, this article also talked a little bit about Receipt Bank. So they said, uh, and this is so talking about BotKeeper, but it says, despite pandemic-related headwinds and competition from the likes of Receipt Bank, among others, the company says it expects a three times year-over-year -year run rate in 2020 and plans that it doesn't employees to do its workforce of over 100. And so because one of the things that are, Bikekeeper is playing up in this is that they basically have their ScanBot feature for scanning, uploading receipts, expenses, sales contracts, right? And so I can see where this author of this article compared to them to Receipt Bank. Yeah. It's all about getting data into the system and processing it so that you can generate those reports. And uh, there's a lot to be said for a human computer hybrid approach as opposed to a a receipt bank where I have to still manage it. I still have to do something. I have to verify the data, but that's why receipt bank bought this company. That's going to validate the data. So they're going at it from different sides. Botkeeper started with mostly people doing the processing, calling them bots, and they are gradually build, building the tech. Whereas receipt bank started as a pure tech approach, no people. And they are, uh, adding in, you know, more data verification stuff so that uh, you yourself don't have to do the processing or validate the processing. Both different approaches, and it's great that we've got uh, both of those uh, competing. So that's all I got for this week for me. That is all I have as well, David. If people want to reach you online, where's the best place for them to do that? Uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm at David Leary. If you on TikTok too, I'm, I'm supposed to be on TikTok. I'm not <laughs> on TikTok. I joined. It's I joined. Okay. I, I joined specifically so I could follow Planet Money. Oh, those commercials worked. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, know, just, I listen to Planet Money all the time, and they said they have a TikTok, and it's actually quite good. It's funny. They that's what I guess that's what they had the interns do over the summer set up a TikTok. I am at Blake T Oliver on Twitter. That's where I like to hang out. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. But if you do, please say you are a listener when you send me a, a connection request. And you can also leave us a voicemail. Yes, we have a voicemail number. You can call 202-695-1040. That is 202-695-1040. Leave us a voicemail. Tell us what you think. Give us a review. We listen to those. And if we uh, deem it high quality, we will play it on the air. Perfect. I think that's a wrap. That's it. Uh, thanks, David. And uh, stay safe. I'll see you next week. Bye. Time for the classifieds. Did you know that in response to the COVID-19 situation that you can now take your Microsoft Excel certification from home? Want to learn how? 
You can by joining Steve Chase's Excel Bootcamp. His summer classes run Monday through Fridays from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time. Register online at sequentiasolutions.com slash bootcamp for $150. If you mention the Cloud Accounting Podcast referred to you, you'll receive an extra $30 off. High school students are highly encouraged to sign up and you can find the link in the show notes. Still sending spreadsheets of unclassified expenses to clients? With Client Hub, automate this process and get client answers instantly. Client Hub is a client communication platform that helps you consolidate client communication, securely share files, and instantly get answers and much, much more. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app and enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Client Hub, frictionless client communication. <laughs> 